Okay, well, with no further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Um, Stefano uh, Deandra is, a, is an industry uh, or an industrial graphic expert. Um, he's dedicated his entire professional career to flexography. Um, uh, he's dedicated exclusively to technical education in flexography. He also manages the Flexo Expert and Flexo.training websites. And also a little bit about Stefano is uh, his music. Music is his hobby. Uh, he plays keyboards and guitar, directs a small choir, and sings as tenor in a uh, polyphonic vocal group called Shansun Adobe. And did I blow that, Stefano? <laughs> yeah. I'm working on that one. So, that folks, was great. Our, our uh, great friend from Italy is uh, Mr. Stefano Deandra. Stefano, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you. So, hello. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, uh, buonasera. Uh, I think we have registrations from several time zones today. Uh, so, thank you, FTA US, and thank you, FTA Europe, and Ati for allowing me to be here. So, uh, let's start with, uh, uh, with today's session. So today we are going to discuss about the measurement of dots within the flexographic process. I just wanted to add a little side note from myself because my main activity is training and consultancy within the flexographic printing process, both as an independent trainer and in collaboration with technical institutes and associations. So if you find this content to be explained in a too much, say, educational way, well, that is on purpose, and that's the way I do it. Uh, so Joe uh, said that if you have any questions, please ask, and then we will manage to have uh, answers uh, for you. Um, so I like very much the title of today because it sounds very promising for a technical session. And, uh, also somewhat challenging. It's time to change something, to change the way you measure dot percentage. So why do we measure dots and their percentage? Indeed, perhaps we should first ask a different question. Why do we measure at all? Let me use an old advert to emphasize one renowned statement. Measurement is the basis of process control, right? So if you can measure it, you can control it. We must have heard this so many times during sessions about process control of our flexographic environment. And we know that we have several aspects within our production process that need to be controlled and therefore measured. We take uh, measurements during the calibration procedures to obtain numbers that describe the behavior of our printing system. And we take actions based on these numbers regarding press components and setup. Think of what we do when we evaluate the results from one uh, analog banded wall trial and analysis, or when we are running any optimization or fingerprint test. We do a lot of measurements. We manage with a lot of numbers, right? Then we apply corrections based on such measurements in order to modify um, uh, the output of our artwork and uh, obtain a desired result. A typical example is represented by the dot gain compensation curves that we use in our workflow. And finally, we need to control that our printing system delivers the expected results during a production. And therefore, again, we need to measure. So you see how measurement of colors really plays a fundamental role in our process management, especially when considering the loop of steps described in the first methodology, from optimization through fingerprint, process control, characterization, need of improvement, and back again to optimization. In all these steps, we measure color, we measure the characteristics of the inks that we use in the process, both spot and process colors. We measure their solid lay down and very important, the characteristics of half tones, the dot percentage, the area coverage that reproduces the tone values of our colors. I loved when uh, Mark Samworth 
told us in a previous webinar uh, that printing is a series of binary processes. Yeah, the TIFF file sends on-off information to a laser that will write or don't write an image that will create a printing surface where we will have printing or non-printing areas. There is no intermediate information, no almost on laser or almost printing surface. In fact, when we have such ambiguities, they represent defects or critical issues in the process. So we don't have many inks to reproduce the different tone values of images. We only have one single ink per color and the printing substrate. Therefore, it is very important to determine how the ink and its half tones interact with the substrate to reproduce the tone values of our printing reproduction. We need to measure and calibrate the size of dots, both on the printing plate and on the printed substrate in order to establish process control aims and progress corrections to obtain the desired result. Well, we well know what happens when working with a flexible, resilient flexographic plate in combination with a liquid ink, right? There is a first compression of the plate against the analog roll that loads the printing surface of the plate with ink. And then there is another compression of the printing plate against the substrate that will produce again some deformations on the plate that determine the structure and consequentially the appearance of the printed ink layer, especially when dealing with a non-absorbent substrate. So we normally expect that our printed dots will be slightly larger than plate dots, don't we? It's a kind of uh, expected or natural behavior with any relief printing system, and in particular, in flexography. So printed dots are slightly bigger than plate dots, but it's okay, we know that. Well, sometimes our printed dots are <laughs> bigger than what we expected. Maybe we use too much ink, maybe the volume of the analogs was too high, or was it a too soft plate, too hard adhesive tape, mounting tape, or the compression of the plate package under the impression nib produced too much deformation and we had some slurring. We are here in the optimization phase of, of our calibration control. And uh, among the activities we do to define the preferred operative parameters while balancing quality, stability, and efficiency, as we read from first, we need to apply a tone value compensation that will make our plate dots a little smaller uh, so that when printing in such conditions, the size of the printed dots will correspond to our desired target. So let's see what happens within our production workflow. In particular, during the phases of calibration of our printing system. So you can follow all these, also checking the tone values in the illustrations, the numbers. We design our artwork that will contain certain tone values and we produce a negative image. This negative can be either onto a separate film or directly onto a black ablative layer on the surface of the plate with Lamb's plate. Well, it could also be direct laser engraving, but sorry, I did not prepare any illustration for that. Uh, but you know, uh, the concept is the same. So uh, we, can, we can follow it with a standard uh, negative um, example. So the first step is typically to produce what we call a linear plate without any tonal value adjustment, where 10 is 10, 50 is 50, 70 is 70. So a 50% dot area on a linear plate will have half printable surface with dots that can receive and transfer ink and half non-printable voids. We print our linear plate and we measure and we evaluate the results. This is what we call actual print or uncompensated print from a linear plate. We know that printed tone values cannot be the same as plate values, right? So sometimes the printed tone values could be a bit too much higher than what we expected. And what do we normally expect? 
Well, our expectation is represented by a target reference curve that describes the print dot gain condition to match. The values of this curve are reported in different editions of the ISO 126476, uh, that is regarding the flexographic process, and implemented in several workflows to standardize the reproduction of tone values before the application of other calibration techniques, such as gray balance or repurposing with device link profiles. According to this target curve, we wanted a printed value of 50% to measure something around 70%. Actually, the number is exactly 68.7 on that reference curve. But now, when we print it, it measures 80, okay? So we need to correct this. We need to apply a compensation and make a new plate with adjusted values. How do we do that? We search for what was the linear plate value that printed like 70 or 68.7. It was uh, 35. So 35% on our linear plate prints with a value that we expected to find for 50. Okay, then it is easy. We will compensate the 50% down to 35. That's it. That is for 50%. But then a similar search is done for all the tone values that we require to build the complete compensation curve. These compensation values are then input to the imaging rip and we will output a new negative to prepare a new plate, okay? So uh, we produce our compensated plate and here we are typically where at the fingerprint, right? So it's the fingerprint phase when we produce a compensated test form to print. Of course, we check if dots are okay. I mean, we control and measure the dots on plate before printing. And when we print our compensated plate, we are normally happy with the results that we obtain. So we measure dots on the printing plate and on the printed substrate. And uh, there are many different tools on the market that allow to measure the size of the dots, their error coverage in percentage directly onto our flexor plates. And I, of course, encourage you to use these devices not only as tools to calibrate plate making, but also to monitor incoming media in the press room. Check your plates before going to press, okay, with these tools. On the printing plate, therefore, we measure the size of the dots to determine what will be the area of the plate surface that will receive ink and will eventually print. And we express this as dot percentage. Here you can see a quick example that I did with a small digital USB microscope uh, that has measurement capabilities, where I measured a plate dot on a control patch for highlights that was supposed to be 2%. But as you can see, in this case, it was slightly above two, it was 2.3%, okay? Uh, first refers to dot percentage and tolerances in plate making in different chapters. Uh, here you can see the suggested values for films and digital masks in uh, digital plate making and how these values are indicated on prepress scale and control targets. When referring to printed dots, first gives us many other useful recommendations about the expected printed uh, values, uh, their tolerances, and the way to measure them. You can notice here that first recommends to use Murray Davis to measure dot area and dot gain. What is this Murray Davis? Murray Davis is a formula that we use to calculate the value of dot area in percentage, an equation that was introduced back in 1936, 85 years ago. This formula requires three values, reflectance of the substrate, reflectance of the full solid ink, and the reflectance of the half ton to calculate the dot percentage or dot area of that tone value. For those like me who play with Excel spreadsheets, it is also known in a modified version that considers the density values 
of solid and half tone. It is just easier because when working with uh, playing with the densitometer, I get the value of density uh, and I don't play with the actual value of reflectance. So I have my uh, solid and half, um, and half tone zeroed on the substrate. But really, I don't want to bother you with this formula now because oh, I think we need to focus on different concepts. When we measure dot percentage on a half tone, we use a densitometer that requires three measurements. The first value that we measure is the maximum reflection of light given by the substrate, okay? Then we measure the minimum reflection provided by the solid ink on that substrate. And finally, we measure the partial reflection provided by the half tone that we need to control. So we have seen how we measure plate dots and printed dots. And uh, are we sure we are talking about the same thing? Because here we are, we call them both dot percentage on plate or dot percentage on print. We use the same name, but they actually refer to two different aspects, right? So plate dot area is a mechanical value. We measure the area coverage of what could receive ink from the analog roller and transfer it onto the substrate. Printed dot area instead is an optical value. We measure the absorption of light created by the ink that acts as a filter on the substrate. And we know that uh, in, in this case, coverage can be influenced by voids, donuts, pinholes, slurring that affects the ink lay down. Okay, that's not the only issue though. Okay, uh, it is reasonable that a 50% um, dot on plate prints a slightly larger dot. But why do we target to a 70% or that specific number 68.7? There are several reasons. But first of all, let me ask Joe if he can uh, launch the poll, a poll for your first poll for you. Uh, so I want to ask you a question. Okay, so the question is, uh, what is half color for you? So between A and B, what would you consider to be the half between the full solid color that you see at the bottom and the substrate that you see on top? I'm curious to see some results. Yeah. Joe, what do you think? A lot of results are still rolling in, Stefano. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will uh, stop it here when I see things slow down, but they're rolling in pretty good and it's neck and neck. Okay. Okay, seems to have slowed down a bit. I'll go ahead and share that with everyone. Oh, wait, okay. it just picked up again. All right. Yeah, people are probably looking at it, trying to, trying to. <laughs> is this a trick question that Stefano's throwing? No, it's not a trick question. It's just a curiosity on my side. <laughs> Let's go ahead and share that with everyone. There you go, folks. Okay, okay. So it's interesting. Uh, okay, it's interesting because, uh, of course, it, it, it depends on the on the color that we look at. Uh, our eyes, our perception works in a. In a in, in a strange way, but uh, typically our perception will lead us to see half color somewhere around what we call a, me a Murray Davis measurement of approximately 60 to 70 percent. So uh, the the uh, even even with the black, <clears throat> the value on the right was 70, and the value on the left was 50. When we think about a measurement of 50% on print, probably we think about a slightly lighter color, okay? Because we have uh, in mind, we have these numbers coming from the densitometer from that Murray Davis measurement. Although 50%, the, the, the number 50%, 0.5 should mean something like the half of something, right? So there is actually not much alignment between our perception and the measurement. Okay, but again, I don't want to go into uh, sophisticated technical formulas here. Let's see something more. Uh, if we look at our target reference curve, we see this 50% going to 68.7, 70%, whatever. 
That curve was actually derived from the curve C of FOGRA 27 characterization. Yes, we are talking of a legacy offset printing characteristics onto paper substrate with offset plates, offset inks, offset system. This curve was adapted to flexography by adding a little bump in the highlights to, let's say, to accommodate for a flexotypical behavior in those areas. Okay, but uh, why should we match offset TVIs in flexo? Hmm? That's another good question to, uh, that sh we should answer. And uh, there is more. The Murray Davis formula is okay for CMYK. It's always been okay. I mean, we've been using it for so many years. But how do we manage half tones in spot colors? So if I read straight from the text that is uh, uh, on, on the first, uh, with the ever-increasing need to control brand colors tints and the growing popularity of expanded gamut ink sets, it became clear that a new methodology was required. Yeah, we print in expanded gamut, seven colors, and how do I, how do I define the TVI curves and the corresponding compensation curves for, for these uh, expanded gamut colors? that uh, or, or even for normal spot colors that are printed with half tones. How would the printed aspect match with the artwork on screen or on proof? In fact, if I use, uh, if we use the uh, Murray Davis <clears throat> formula on our densitometer to define a dot gain for an expanded uh, gamut color like green, when we read the solid, the densitometer behaves like over a cyan. It, it thinks that yeah, that's kind of a cyan. But when we move to highlights, the, it looks like a yellow. So the automatic filters may not give correct results. So Mary Davis is limited on this and we need another formula. This fact was renowned for a certain time. And in fact, when trying to find a solution for this, Several different methods and formulas to measure the tone value of spot colors have been evaluated. For sure, you must remember to have attended at least one presentation by Steve Smiley on this subject, okay? Because I've stolen <laughs> the slide from his PowerPoint. But still, there was no alignment, especially between artwork creation software and printed results. So uh, at a certain point in time, 2015, I received my paper copy of the first 5.1, and I saw this chapter, this appendix H, page 393 on the paper version. Uh, well, I was <laughs> stumbling upon this, this paper, this, this page, and I said, wow, this, this is fantastic. A new formula to calculate the tone value of spot colors. That's so interesting. Well, actually the formula was new to me, but uh, the formula itself was introduced some 10 years before during a TAGA technical conference by William Birkett and Charles Pontelli. They presented uh, this new method to measure colored ink ramps using colorimetry instead of densitometry to provide colorimetric tone value measurements. And again, first 6.0 arrived some years later, and here we find the formula again. It actually gained two positions moving from appendix H to F, but I, I bet it will deserve more attention in the next version seven of first. So uh, I tell you, when uh, for me this formula was a kind of love at first sight, really. I started testing and using it immediately, taking measurements, doing experience. Although my spectrodensitometer uh, could only output LAB values. So I was doing all calculations with a spreadsheet and taking the formula, uh, comparing and blah, blah. Well, the formula said spot colors only, but sure, I promised I used it only for spot colors, as you can see, right? So the reason why I love this new formula was because uh, now finally plate mechanical area coverage and printed optical tone value are measured with two methods that are equivalent and that maintain proportional spacing of the tones. With this measurement, optical and mechanical values are aligned finally. 50% on plate and 50% on printed substrate have the same meaning 
they both express a tone value that is in the middle, at the half of the solid, full solid, and the none, no printing or printed elements on the plate, right? So two years later, ISO finally published the norm 2654 for spot color tone value, commonly known as SCTV. That's the, the acronym that we use to, uh, to describe this, this method. This new formula, as we can read from the text on the norm, produces approximately uniform visual spacing of tones between substrate and solid. SCTV is calculated from spectral reflectance or colorimetric measurements of the solid ink, the substrate, and one or more patches or intermediate tones to be measured. So SCTV uses spectral data or colorimetric data that work across the entire visible spectrum. It is not restricted to portion of the spectrum limited by densitometric filters, okay? The formula is much more complex compared to Murray Davis. But again, we don't have to worry about this. The calculation is done within the instrument, okay? Only those crazy guys like me that like to play with Excel formulas uh, and, and, and wanted to repeat the formula in the spreadsheet. <laughs> but uh, our instrument can do the, the calculation for us and just release the, uh, and display the value that we need. The good news, is that the latest edition of the ISO 126476 about flexography that was published last year, 2020, allows the usage of SCTV formula to define the tone value curves for both CMYK and spot colors. Now, this is really a game changer, okay, in our process. So, uh, Joe, can I ask you to launch the other poll that we prepared? Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. So the question is about uh, what is your approach, uh, your relationship with SCTV? Uh, are you uh, an early adapter? You're already working with it? Are you just waiting uh, on the window and, uh, and see what happens? Uh, so tell us what you do with SCTV. A lot of answers still rolling in, so we'll give it a minute. Or Okay. About 30 seconds or so, Stefan. How is the internet connection uh, at the moment? Is it, coming, is it coming across real nice? Yeah. Okay. I always have this <laughs> problem of connection here. It's okay. But fortunately, I, I hope it's, uh, it's okay today. All right. Let's go ahead and share these results. Okay. And there you go. Oh. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I say that I did not expect so many people, so many answers that uh, don't know uh, what it is SCTV? Okay. Okay. I love it and I use it for spots and CMYK. 8%. That's interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So for those of you uh, that... Uh, uh, haven't yet started with SCTV, or let's see some real life examples. Okay, I prepared some screenshots and with some instruments. And uh, when you do measurements with SCTV, you see that there is absolutely no difference, no changes in the way that you do the measurements. To measure a dot percentage, you first measure the substrate, then you measure your solid, then the half tone, just, just like before. It is just using, uh, just the same as using the, uh, the, the, the old Murray Davis formula as before, exactly the same actions, one, two, three, paper, zero paper, solid, half ton, just different settings on your instrument, okay? You just need the, to set on your instrument the uh, SCTV um, setting. And of course, you will get different numbers on the display, right? In the example you see here, I am reading a, uh, a magenta, a 50% magenta that was slightly overcompensated according to SCTV measurement because it measures 46, okay? Um, but probably it was not uh, calibrated in, in SCTV by that time. So what changes in the measurements we see on the display? Well, the numbers will be different, 
and we need to get acquainted with a new system. But I tell you, it takes very short time to do it. The same patch at 40% will simply read 40% instead of 58.2, okay? So it 40 needs reads 40, okay? You know, when preparing these slides, this presentation, I actually needed to take a look at the values in Murray Davis because I did not remember by heart what value was supposed to print at 40, 58.2. Can, can you remember by heart? No, I, I don't. I have to read somewhere. With SCTV, it is so easy. It has to be 40. Think how easy communication could be with this, with this method. And uh, SCTV can be used to calculate tone value of any colors in any printing system. So it allows better alignment across different printing technologies between proofing and printing, okay? And uh, it will provide uh, proportional visual spacing of the tones without any compressions. This would require a deeper discussion about the way it work, the formula works, but uh, uh, I consider that this fact will allow easier, much, much easier calibration of the tones in your process. Calibration of the tones is another, is another big question. How do, do we manage with our compensation curves in SCTV? What about this uh, uh, calculation of these compensations? Uh, when we do compensation curves from SCTV, it works exactly in the same way, like with standard input values from Murray Davis, exactly in the same way. But it is just easier because the reference target is linear. Okay, it's not a curve, it is just a, a line. So we calculate a compensation to adjust plate values in order to match a linear target. I will show you some examples here. Do we need to change the compensation curves in our workflow? Mm -hmm. uh, when we measure with Murray Davis, uh, we target to, so this is a measurement uh, of patches with Murray Davis. I had a question uh, uh, the days before when I was uh, testing the presentation, why don't you have any, any, uh, any line below 5%? because the first patch <laughs> to be measured was 5%. So I don't have any, any, any dot below 5 so, so these are the actual measurement I took. Um, the reference curve uh, that we use, so still the same curve, uh, was derived from Murray Davis measurement and we calculate compensation values, okay? So this will be the compensation curve that will be applied in the RIP to output our plates. With SCTV, of course, we get different measurements. So if I measure the same patches, this is the curve that comes from my SCTV measurement, okay? Uh, and our target is now linear. It's a line, a straight line. And when we calculate our compensation, the difference might not be that much, okay? They are not exactly identical. Don't expect them to be identical because they cannot be identical but they really cannot be very much different, okay? Anyway, once you embrace SCTV method, it is definitely a good idea to review your curves. That's, that's a good idea. Stefano, before you move yeah. on, a question yeah. came in, if I could. Um, the, it was pretty much uh, kind of device specific, and it, it's really, you know, how is SCTV handled with an X-ray platform? I have uh, some... Um, um, screenshots of the different uh, measurement instruments in some slides after this. Okay. So okay. I, can, I can show you, yeah. And then and another one just rolled in, is SCTV used only for process build Pantone colors? No, 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 no. The SCTV was actually developed to measure spot colors, Pantone colors, pastel colors, uh, green, uh, orange, uh, brown. Okay, so not, not only the, uh, not only the process colors, okay? So if, if I consider a Pantone color built in CMYK, that is not a Pantone color. It's just a CMYK separation, okay? I, I give it a name, like, you know, trying to match that, uh, that color from the Pantone uh, swatch book, but uh, it is a separation. It's a standard separation. Now, this SCTV formula was actually developed to measure spot colors, okay? So um, really spot color, not, not, not process colors. 
Yep. And I think yeah. your daughter agrees with you. There, there is another one that came up, uh, and that is, can SCTV be used for black? I was told, can't remember by who, that SCTV worked fine for all colors with the exception of black. Maybe they were misinformed or spreading rumors. Can you answer? Yeah, that? well, this this, uh, this is not rumors, actually. Um, but I would correct a statement. I wouldn't say uh, it doesn't work for black. Uh, for uh, with black, it, it is uh, less uh, less accurate at the moment. Uh, but the, we are talking. You know, when when these uh, when these calculations are done, the mathematicians that uh, that do all this all this stuff, they consider a tremendous gap if you have a, a variation of two three percent okay so uh be aware that uh, calibrating your black with sctv uh you can still do that okay so there is no problem in in using sctv with black it's not true that it doesn't work it works but uh, uh and the, uh, the the formula itself probably uh requires maybe in the future there will be uh an update uh similar to what we what happened with the uh, with Delta E, okay. So we we uh, the, there were um, several developments until we have the current Delta E two thousand. So um, this is uh, uh, this is something uh, that uh, does not prevent us from using uh, SCTV right now, even with black. So I wouldn't stop the use of SCTV for this. Absolutely not. Sure, great, Stefano. Thank you. And also, I just want to clarify. Sergio did put put in a comment that the the. Uh, exact device, the exact X-ray device is uh, compliant with SCTV. So, thank you for sharing. Yes, yeah, yes, they are. Um, all, the, all the all the devices on the market are compliant. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, when you when you actually measure with SCTV and you calibrate with SCTV, you will notice how nicely your printed values will match with your artwork. Uh, actually, these 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 images are coming from actual prints. And you see there is also black here. So um, this really uh, simplifies the communication across different players like designers, pre-press, printing, final customer. OK, I, I'd like to ask if, if there is any printer or pre-press specialist or involved with plate making here. Have you ever tried to explain to a designer or to a final customer that the value of uh, that uh, logo that has a 30% cyan or 30% black or any color that they typed in, the, in their illustrator uh, yeah, you know, guy, yeah, it's correct that it prints 45 point, what is it, 45.7. It's not a defect in printing or plate making. It, it's good. Oh, but I wanted it to be 30. Okay, so uh, did, you, it, did it have a, happen to you? Uh, think of it, because uh, communication, uh, speaking about numbers in this way, it is so smooth, so smooth, and it's very simple. So how do we implement uh, then uh, SCTV in our process control. That's another, another thing that we have to consider. How about variability tolerance? Do we have to change anything in our values? I used to target my 50% to a printed value of 68.7, okay? With a tolerance of plus minus 3%. Now, with SCTV, the printed value should measure 50. How about the tolerance? Can I keep the same plus minus value? Now, uh, when the, um, uh, the, no the ISO norm 2654 uh, was published in 2017, Taga Italy took an action item within the ISO TC 130 to check if current variability tolerances in dot percentage from Murray Davis were still valid when using SCTV. The work of Taga Italy was presented at the ISO meeting in Berlin in 2018, the year after, by Carlo Carnelli. Carlo is the coordinator of the uh, graphic committee in, uh, in, in UNI, uh, so, and he is an um, um, expert in the TC, ISO TC-130. And uh, the, the work of TAGA uh, included several Panton colors that were tested, including CMYK, in different print runs, and they checked Murray Davis and SCTV variability and tolerances. And the answer is yes, we can keep using the same tolerance values. So if we used to print 50% at 68.7 plus minus 3% in Murray Davis, now 
50% print 50 in SCTV with the same variability tolerance, plus minus 3%. It's really just that easy. So we don't have even to, to change <laughs> the tolerances in first. <laughs> Before you continue, I've got a few uh, questions here for you, Stefano. The first one's a pretty easy one. Um, would I expect to get similar SCTV curve results with the same ink at different densities? The uh, the density of the of the color uh, is uh, uh, is will affect the uh, the uh, the curve. The answer is uh, yes, you can have the same curves or you can have different curves in the same way as you can have the same curve of different curves when you change the density or the, uh, of your inks uh, or, the, uh, or the volume of your analog salt. It's exactly the same. So the, uh, if you, uh, sometimes when you do your optimization, test and you measure and you have four different, uh, uh, you, you realize that you may need four different compensation curves, right? And then you say, mm, no, I will use just one for all the colors, okay? And then I will manage maybe the rest with a device link uh, uh, conversion of, uh, of, of, of my colors. Okay, it, it, it is exactly the same thing. So it happens exactly in the same way. So uh, if, if your policy is to keep one standard curve for all the colors, then you know, with Murray Davis, then you can keep one standard uh, correction color with SCTV. It's exactly the same. Okay, and we have a comment here from Mr. Smiley. Uh, work at Fulgra shows banding is reduced in the shadow in black when using SCTV. Moving mm -hmm. away from Murray Davis gives us more steps in our printing, correct? It does yes. not match Murray Davies in densities over 1.5 or below 1.1 densities. Yes, yes. Yeah, actually, yeah, uh, this, this are, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I, I appreciate that Steve uh, can comment on this because I consider him uh, one of the major sources for, uh, for this, for this uh, subject. And then, uh, yeah, uh, actually, we don't forget we are talking of uh, the percentage okay the dot area percentage we're not talking of uh, the uh, the density in, in this case so um, uh, we know that uh, when we measure density uh, we are um, uh, the, the 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 way we measure density and dot percentage with Murray Davis is uh, limited or is affected by the way a densitometry works with um, because of the uh, logarithmic uh, curve of, of density because of the uh, the way the filters are are, um, um, are restricting the values in the spectrum here we are uh, considering all the values for from the entire uh, visible spectrum so we have less limitations than uh, Murray Davis yeah. Okay. Um, let me just throw two things out there for you. Uh, Sergio just commented on that. Uh, it's exactly the same, but I do not suggest using the same compensation for all colors, CMYK, as they are printed uh, diversely. So thank you, Sergio. And then also we have one other question. Um, what would the difference in Delta E if we, what, what is the difference in Delta E, if we are measuring the same color using Murray Davies and SCTV values, uh, the Delta E would be the difference of the, the color. So oh. if you are measuring two colors, the uh, SCTV and Murray Davies is a dot percentage. So they are talking of they they are not comparable. They are two and two diverse entities. So the okay. Delta E is one thing, and uh, and uh, SCTV or Murray Davis for dot percentage is another, is another thing. I cannot compare. Yeah. All right, Spano. We got another one that came in, but I'm going to hold it for a minute and let you continue. Okay. So um, we know that uh, uh, the implementation of expanded gamma printing requires also that orange, green, and violet inks are measured in SCTV, while CMYK can still be measured in Murray Davis. So typically, I have a question from uh, the, uh, the printers where I've started some implementations of expanded gamut. Can we use the same method for all colors rather than switching from SCTV to Murray Davis every time? Uh, well, yes, 
Now we should well consider to adopt SCTV for all colors, including process cyan, um, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, rather than switching back and forth through, uh, through different measurement formulas on our measurement devices, because you have to change your settings every time. So uh, yes, uh, if, you go, if you print expanded gamut, why not using SCTV for all colors? Because uh, we, we can do that. And now to answer to the question of uh, uh, the person that want, uh, wanted to know about uh, um, the different me measurement instruments. Sorry if I forgot some of them. I, I, I just took the ones I had available. Uh, so uh, is there anything else actually that prevents from implementing a CTV immediately? Uh, and as I say, not really. We can start using it straight away. All spectral densitometers available on the market are suitable and include SCTV in their settings, okay? So you can just select the function on your preferred instrument uh, and use it immediately. And here you can see the, 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 the functions where you set your, uh, your, uh, your preferences in the, on the x right on the Tashcon, and uh, on the uh, Peret uh, um, uh, Presto. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, you can, you have to, just to select uh, the, uh, the appropriate function and, uh, and, and use it. Uh, on, the only thing you have to remember is if you want to go back to Murray Davis, uh, like the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the exact, you have to mm, scroll to the page of the, of the settings and reselect Mary Davis to your cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Okay, uh, with uh, the Tashcon is only one. Uh, with the uh, uh, the Parrot is uh, just one. Yeah, so really, you can uh, you can just use it immediately uh, and enjoy the uh, how easy it is uh, to work with SCTV and uh, and spread the news also. And uh, more than spreading the news, I would say involve all your partners, your, uh, your uh, repro house, your designers uh, to start thinking with this new, uh, with this new method. Um, real quick, Stefan, a couple, couple came in uh, before you go to this slide. Uh, there's I got two questions here. Um, all the digital applications, for example, Photoshop, show the data through an ICC profile uh, that have uh, the TBI defined in M and D uh, uh, formula values. Um, there are ICC profiles or characterization data done by calibration with SCTV, and that was kind of uh, no. That that is not exactly correct. When you set a value, uh, a number value, the number value is the output number value that goes. Uh, the uh, what you see as a profile is the color of that. So in fact, when I, when you when you speak with the uh, when, when you are on on your Illustrator or Photoshop and you say magenta 30%, okay? And th that number 30% goes out as 30% of that color. So your, your negative, uh, your image value would be 30%. Okay. okay? Unless, you do, unless you do other conversions. But when you say 30%, that's, gonna, that's the, the, out, the real, let's say, uh, negative value that goes out. Uh, what changes on your screen for, for the color profile is what you see, what the, the appearance on the screen, when if you go to view proof uh, um, on your Photoshop, then you can, you can have a preview of what the color will look like. But the numbers, <laughs> these are the numbers, okay? So. Okay, one more here. Uh, uh, how does or does SCTV work in conjunction with G7 or does it? Oh yeah, sure. It it, it does because uh, you know G seven dot percentage in G seven is an output value from from the G seven calibration, right? So it it, it is a uh, it's a series of numbers that you use to control your uh, your uh, your system. Uh, therefore, it will tell you your gray is made by this and this and this value. So the dot percentage in, in G7 is an output information that you get from the calibration system, okay? So it's not an input, okay? So I don't input percentages uh, to calculate the, the gray balance. I input other, other things. I input uh, densities or uh, more appropriate today, I input um, colorimetric uh, spectrophotometric data. 
So uh, yeah, it worked, and uh, and as far as I know, uh, I, I don't have it loaded here on my on my computer, but I have seen the uh, the, the software uh, to do the calibration for uh, for for G7. Uh, you can actually set it to to, to display um, uh, the dot percentage in, in SCTV. Okay, and we are getting a few more, but I'm going to hold them till the end because I know you're nearing the end, and we're running low on time. So keep on. Going. Okay. 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 So. Um, Somebody told me that the acronym SCTV <laughs> might be misleading, not because it sounds like a second city television or a smiley color tone value, <laughs> as we were taking some jokes on it, but someone might think that spot, the word spot in the acronym limits the application only to some colors, okay? I think it's time to, new, to move to a new language of communication. Uh, we might consider to remove the word spot and let's call it simply CTV, okay? Uh, this could be color tone value or more appropriate colorimetric tone value as suggested by the original name in the birkitz pontelli method, okay? So after almost 70 years of flexography, we are again ready to say goodbye to something, but this time it's not to Annelie, but instead to Murray Davis, huh? and ready to welcome CTV for flexography. So let's move together these color TVs, and that's the way we do it with CTV. And saying this, I must say, Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, uh, to FTA, to FTA Europe and ATIF for allowing me to, to join the F FQC technical committee. And I hope you enjoyed this session. And of course, I'm available for any questions you may have. Yeah, Grazie. very, very well done, Stefano. There are a couple here I'm gonna hit you with. Um, uh, as you know, the proposed SCTV formula may give as result a value greater than 100%, like 104 to 108%, uh, this value may be considered quite strange as a result. There are some guidelines uh, on this, or are there some guidelines on this, or are there, is there an update of the formula? I frankly never experienced a value over 100 because when I measure with SCTV, I zero on my substrate, okay? And then it shows zero. I measure the solid and it shows the density value and 100, okay? And then when I read the intermediate half tones, I always have a percentage. Okay. If, I, if I, let's say, if I click again, onto the solid, it may happen just, just like uh, 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 that, that it happens when you, when you, when you work with, uh, with Murray Davis. Sometimes the instrument, I mean, when you, when, you, when you clicked on your solid, you didn't take, uh, let's say, the darkest area on your solid maybe, and then you click on another, in a, another position, then you can have another, another value. But uh, the formula itself requires zero, 100, and then the intermediate value. So there is no reason why you should have uh, uh, a, a higher value than, uh, than 100. Yeah, and, and Smiley Color just com commented on that. It's only possible, just like Murray Davies, if the 90% is heavier than the solid, which- Sure, absolutely, right, right, right. right. If you, if you're, you're on, yeah, sure, if your 100% is, is lighter than the 95 or 97 because of ink filling in your, uh, in your reverses and making it darker, of course, yeah. Yeah, and then there's just one other one, Stefano, and, and that is high, but basically it's the same offset rule, or am I all wrong here? Is it what? It, it high, but basically it's the same offset rule, or am I wrong? I, I don't know, maybe that's something that they're referring to offset printing that they're doing, I'm not sure. Well, uh, if, if, if the question is, does it work with offset as well? Yes, it works with offset, with gravure, with digital printing, with uh, inkjet uh, for proofing. Yeah. Okay. And Stefano, I will send you these these uh, the Q and A stuff so that you can respond uh, via email. Sure. Like as well. I'll do that. Sure. Uh, and that pretty much is it. Uh, you know, 
we came right to the top of the hour, Mr. Fano. Excellent job. You did, you did a fine job. And, and ladies and gentlemen, if you found this interesting, I'm going to invite you to mark down on your calendar for June 3rd, the next FTA uh, member NAR. Uh, Stefano will actually take this to a whole other level and he'll talk about natural plate compensation curves. And that's really, he branded it kind of NPC. Um, if you enjoyed this, you're not going to want to miss that. We will have that available um, probably in the next few weeks uh, for registration. And as you know, we will be taking uh, May off because we'll be doing quite the quite the webinar or webinar uh, with our annual forum, which will be all virtual. And again, I invite you to visit our website to, to get yourself registered for that. Stefano, can't thank you enough for doing this for us on behalf of the FQC committee, the first committee. We really appreciate you going through this very interesting uh, technology. So with okay. that, grazie to you. <laughs> thank you. Grazie, everybody. And, really. and, uh, you have okay. a great day, Stefano. Everybody have a great day.